Good afternoon fellow aircraft builders and aviation enthusiasts. This is my first video attempt uh, to document the progress of my Zenith CH750 aircraft. I am building it from plans which means I'm not buying uh, prefabricated parts from the factory with the exception of some welded parts because I'm not a welder. And the reason I'm building from plans is partly from necessity. It's the cheapest way to build an aircraft. It's also the most rewarding. The part I'd like to show you that I'm working on today is the elevator trim tab. Now this is the part that goes on the very back of the elevator and is electrically, or it's uh, actuated by an electric motor and helps keep the aircraft level in flight so you don't constantly have to manually adjust your altitude. Now if you look at the plans here, this is the drawing for the elevator trim tab. And this is what I would consider a complex bend um, or a part with complex bends. Now the plans call for this to be uh, just under four feet long and you can see the dimensions with the bend angles here and there's an 18 millimeter overlap in the upper right hand corner. Now because I'm using a homemade bending brake, uh, every bending brake has its own characteristics. You can see here I've got an eight foot piece of angle iron. Um, it's actually three pieces with a piano hinge down the center of the two of the bending nose and the uh, bending arm. And the profile shot here, I've got a piece of oak trim, a solid oak board that I've radius here for 1 8 inch radius which is what the plans call for at a 45 degree angle setback so that I can overbend it if I need to. So if you simply look at the dimensions on the blueprints it gives you this side needs to be 30 millimeters, this side is 90 millimeters, this side is 105 with an 18 millimeter overlap. If you simply add all those dimensions together to cut out your flat part you're going to end up with too much material at either end depending on which end you start with from bending. So you have to do what's called a developed length calculation to determine where your bend lines need to be, how far you need to set back the bending radius in order to establish a proper dimension on each part. As you bend metal around a radius you end up with extra metal on one side or the other because the curvature of the metal around the radius of course is a shorter distance than a simple 90 degree uh, rigid bend. So on this particular part, I made three examples before I got it right. And I started with a 20 millimeter wide piece of aluminum strip. Of course, the finished part will be just under four feet long, but uh, I started with three of these. And if you look at the drawings, I'll try to orient them exactly the way the drawing is. All these parts look almost identical but they have very slight variations in their bend radii to determine exactly the right part. If you see this one here, the top flap is too overlapped. This one is actually the correct part, although I was hand forming a little bit of it at the last uh, to get it to uh, lay properly, but this is actually the correctly formed part with the proper dimensions at the, as a finished product. And this was the first one I did that was actually just too too small. So by a little bit of experimentation with smaller pieces of aluminum, I came up with this dimension here, the developed length of the part uh, in flat sheet form is 242 millimeters by the required length of 1126 millimeters. My bend lines are at 17, 30, 90, and 104. And that corresponds to the bend lines up here. This needs to be an 18 millimeter flange, a 30 millimeter side, a 90 millimeter side, and a 105 millimeter side. So the 17 down here corresponds to the 18. When I bend that 17 to the proper dimension, it actually ends up being an 18 millimeter flange. Bend again at 30 and 90, that gives me the actual 30 and 90 dimensions. And then at 104, because there's so much extra material uh, that it gives you going around this radius by making it one millimeter short, it actually ends up being 105 millimeters. So if we look over here, I have the, the part flat, and I apologize for the lighting. This is my homemade shop in my garage. So here's my material. And it is 1126 millimeters uh, long, all the way down to the uh, waste bin. I've marked my lines here at 17 millimeters, 
30 millimeters between those two, 90 between these two, and 104 uh, on this side. If I've done it correctly, it'll turn out quite uh, straight and in accordance with the plans. The construction standards call for a one millimeter tolerance, so I'm hoping to be, uh, if not perfect, then well, well within that one millimeter tolerance. So I'm gonna pause the video, bend the part, and see how it turns out. Okay, so here you can see I have the part blank clamped into my bending brake. Now with a little experimentation, I determined that in order to get the proper uh, bend line, and it would be hard to see here, but um, when my part is clamped in the brake, you can just barely see the bend line under the nose. And because of the radius, you can see it here, but as you go up over top of it, it's barely visible in this video. But as you move down the length of the part, you can see that bend line is just barely visible on the front of it, and there is some variation in the bending nose on the board, uh, but for the most part it'll turn out pretty good. So I have to bend this as far as I can, take it out of the brake, and bend it a little bit farther using a long board by hand to make sure that I get the 48 degree bend in it that the plans call for. I'll go ahead and pause again and be back when that's done. Okay, so as I suspected, uh, with a longer piece of material, I wasn't going to be able to uh, bend it exactly to the 48 degree bend that I need on my protractor here. So I ended up using the hand seamer, uh, which actually in my case is just a piece of wood with a groove cut in it, right here. And I overbent, just working my way down the material until I had as close as I can get to the 48 degrees, which is a perfectly acceptable method to get your bend angle. Uh, warped the piece a little bit, which is normal. Every time you bend metal, it wants to stretch and move. So that's pretty good. I'm gonna, I'm gonna end up, as you go down the uh, edge of the material, it tightens up and becomes a good angle. But uh, I'm gonna straighten that out by hand just a little bit more. Um, and uh, it turned out okay. You can see it's not very wavy. But I'm going to straighten those uh, little wavy lines out. You can see there a little better. There's some waviness. I'm going to straighten those out just a little bit better, and then I'm going to put it in the brake and bend it the rest of the way. Okay, so I've made the first two bends, and you can see the uh, angled here on the aluminum. And something I'd like to point out on a homemade brake like this, especially when you have a part that's so wide it has to go past the sticks out the back of your of your bending brake is you lose the ability to clamp in the very center. So you can see here I've got a clamping bolt here uh, that goes all the way through the table and clamps the, the nose down to the, or the shoe rather, down to the, the bed. Uh, but here I've had to remove that bolt because this part is longer and wider than I can accommodate with the bolt in there. And so I'm only clamping it end to end. What makes what happens, and you might be able to see it in the video here, is that the center of this will have a tendency to have a slight bow to it because you're not clamping as hard and the material will uh, bow a little bit in the middle. This is less pronounced if you're only bending, say, a 20 millimeter flange all the way down and you have all of your bolts in place. But on these longer parts with the uh, width that goes all the way through, uh, this is 25 thousandths 6061 T6 aluminum, and that's actually a uh, very rigid aluminum. It's soft to drill through and to uh, work with as far as cutting, but it's a quite a rigid uh, material to bend in a homemade brake, uh, particularly one with it's nothing more than like a piano hinge here and things like that. So you can see now, you can see more of the wavy lines uh, from, the, from the reflection here. Um, from the hand bending that I had to do and what that does is it actually stretches the metal a little bit along this outside edge and that's what causes this to push outward towards me uh, in the bending brake when it's not clamped in the center. It still does it when the clamp is in place but it's far less pronounced so I'm going to do the final bend on this uh, as, as far as I can uh, 
I'm going to pull it out of the brake and then hand bend it with uh, just a piece of wood and press it against the table to finish off the uh, amount that needs to bend and hopefully we'll have a uh, relatively perfect part and we'll see you in a few minutes. Okay well I bent it as far as I could in the brake and this, and then I used a uh, I just laid it against the table and put a 2x4 along this edge here and bent it as hard as I can. Now the problem is, is because that is such a uh, significant bend uh, the material, this 25 thousandths, which is very stiff, has a lot of spring back. So you see if I close it down here to end up where it's supposed to, it springs back a full roughly 30 degrees. So we have to overbend it uh, approximately about 10 more degrees past where you need it to end up in order to have it lay against this flange. Now the problem is because I can do it manually with a, or just by hand, with a 20 millimeter wide piece, um, I have to find a longer clamping method to do this with a four foot piece. Okay, this is turning out to be more difficult than I originally thought. You can see I've got the piece now clamped underneath the bending shoe of the uh, bending brake, or the shoe of the bending brake. I've got it clamped down to the, uh, as hard as I can basically, so that it won't slip. It's slightly bowed out here in the center and you can also see that it's it's bowed upwards. That's normal. That happens when you clamp and bend metal. Um, what I'm basically doing is tightening my clamping bolts down as hard as I can so that when you get underneath that edge basically what I want is the angle of the material. Okay, so you look down there. I want this angle here between the bottom of the shoe uh, and the top of the bed mount here to essentially be 10 degrees less than I need for this to, to bend so that I overbend it and it springs back into position. It's going to be difficult because I actually have it clamped almost all the way down to where it's supposed to be, but then I continue. I have to continue to bend it farther to get that proper angle when it springs back. Okay, I've got it clamped down as uh, much as I can. We're getting down to the limit uh, due to the offset angle here. I'm starting to actually splinter and crack the wood. These bolts are normally uh, perp perpendicular to the, this surface here, um, but you can see they're actually flexing quite a bit and more or less perpendicular to the top surface. So that means they're bending and chafing and everything else. But if you look along the bend line there, the edge of the uh, edge of the uh, trim channel here is getting rather curved, which is what we want. We want it to be bent here further than it needs to be so it springs back into position. And the front nose of it is actually looking pretty good uh, for alignment. I'm going to try to clamp it just a little bit more, maybe a few more degrees, especially in the center, and we'll see what we end up with. Okay, so this is the final product. This is what we ended up with. Uh, very happy the way this turned out. There's a little bit of curvature to the metal, but that's normal. Um, again, the way we were overbending it uh, by clamping this side uh, caused that slight bow, uh, which I can actually probably work out by hand a little bit. So what we wanted is an 18 millimeter flange from the uh, axis or the uh, edge of the uh, radius on that side, and that's pretty much what we ended up with if you, if you measure it from exactly the correct spots. We have an 18 millimeter flange out to the edge of the circle there. We needed 30 millimeters between edges on this side and we're good there. And we needed 90 between the edges there and I think we're maybe off by one millimeter along this edge and that can be accounted for by this by this slight bow in the material. But uh, again our tolerances are we construction standards are within one millimeter. So even if we don't take that bow out, we're still good. And then the top flange uh, is needs to be 105. And right out to the very edges, we're about one and 104 and a half to 105, depending on where you measure along the length of this. So our length is good. Our bend angles are good. And there actually is a little uh, overlap here on the very edge. You see how the top flange sticks out past where the curve starts that it actually is shown in the plans and what you end up with of course is a uh, very nice straight 
rigid part. In the center, of course, we have a little, little bit of a gap. You can see here, it's uh, gapped a little bit because the center just doesn't doesn't want to bend quite the same as the outside edges. Again, that's normal. Uh, the rivets will actually hold this in place without any problem. And in the uh, construction of the aircraft, of course, we need a, a piano hinge in between the two of these anyway, uh, so that it can articulate for the trim. The biggest tip I can give fellow builders out there is if your plan's building and you have your homemade brake, uh, spend a lot of time carefully setting it up so that you understand it's the way that it bends your material uh, before you cut a nice four foot piece of aluminum and bend it. Make some several test strips like I did. These right here will tell you what your uh, bend line, where your bend lines need to be, your setback uh, on the bending nose and everything else uh, before you bend an expensive part because this is much cheaper to throw away than that entire piece. So good luck with your plans, projects, and your airplane builds, and uh, I hope to shoot some more videos in the future and show you my progress. Thanks for watching.